Welcome to the Providence Church Podcast. For more Providence Church, visit us online at provchurch.net. That's P-R-O-V-Church.net. Let's get into it. You know, it's, it's easy to let your heart be troubled. Jesus said, Don't let, do not let your heart be troubled. But it's easy for us. We, we, have, our, we have our personal moments, sometimes our seasons, when we are struggling to live with hope. I know earlier in this summer, we had quite a summer, as many of you know, you prayed us through that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But there were some early, those early days in the, when the Heather was in the ICU, when we were, I was still wondering, is she going to make it? And will she pull through? And can she come out of this? And this is a big, big hill to climb. And praying, yes, but also, wow, God, this is, this is a big deal. This is a heavy situation that we're confronting right now. And so you have moments in your life when you face something perhaps similar, not the same thing, but something similar. And you wonder. Maybe those of you who have lost a spouse or lost a child or you had to endure a divorce and it left you feeling, well, how are we going to get through that? How am I going to get through this? Um, Lost a job so suddenly, you know, you work and all of a sudden it's not there anymore. Now where? Or you get a really hard diagnosis from a doctor. You went to a doctor's office or a hospital. And it's like, wow, this is going to be a major, major league. And so we have, it's easy to let your hearts be troubled. And also on top of that, we also live in a world that is filled with an ever increasing sense of hopelessness. And it wasn't long ago we were praying for the folks in Hawaii, the wildfires that ravaged the island and a hundred more, more people died, lost their lives. Then, then, of course, this past, these past couple of weeks, we heard about the earthquake in Morocco and over 2,500 perished in that earthquake. And now this past week, floods in Libya and uh, over, now feared over 20,000 may have perished in that flood. It just swept the whole town away. I was actually praying the other day, thinking about what if, what if a flood just, I was, th- God, this is just how God sometimes speaks to me to make it personal. What if a thing, something like that happened in Coryville just <laughs> swept off the map by a flood, raging flood waters. And there goes the whole town and whole family. I mean, wow. Like it, it, it really makes it up close. People are suffering today. Jeremy prayed in his prayer for the families in Oxford, right down the the road, you know, a, a neighboring town and, and uh, devastating fires this week. There's the grinding war in Ukraine, and it's out of the news. You've noticed it doesn't make as many news headlines as it did a year ago, but they're still fighting. There's still people ki- being killed and still slogging it out, side and missiles and bombs and loss of life and fear and desperation in Ukraine. There's the scourge of international terrorism. It hasn't gone away. Haiti, I mean, Jeff used to get into Haiti regularly and hasn't been to Haiti in several years. It's just that bad. You cannot get in safely to the country. It's chaos. Gangs rule. And it's awful. There are deep racial divides still in this nation. There is political wrangling They're facing another budget showdown here in the next couple weeks. Will it get passed? A lot. There is so much fear and uncertainty and a heaviness that pervades in many people's lives. And it is a significant moment for the church to rise up. I like to say to people, these are great days to be alive, great days to be the church because of the, de- the desperation and hopelessness around us. We have something to offer. And we live out of this deep sense of hope that is to mark our lives as Christ followers. So that's why Jesus said in the upper room when his disciples were a little hopeless because he talked about his death and the coming battle uh, that, that, he's, that he's now facing uh, the Son of Man must suffer and die, and, and, and now it's come to that time, and they're in the upper room. He says in John 14, verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Trust in God. Trust also in me, he says. And so the reality is that whatever is shifting and uncertain and, and fearful around us, 
We have an anchor of trust in the sovereign goodness and faithfulness of God through Jesus Christ. And we are called as his people with, a great, with great love and compassion and genuine hope to invite others to grab on to him. Grab on. I mean, that is in some ways that we'll, we'll, we'll pare it down. That's some way, the simplicity of the message. Grab on to him. Take hold of him. Put your faith in him. Believe in him. Trust in him, right? Hmm. In fact, let's declare it this morning. The mission of the church has always been to bring hope to people all around us who long for something concrete beyond the circumstances that they encounter. Because we encounter a lot of things in our lives, some of which I mentioned earlier, a lot of things that are unsettling and, and we make us wonder and cause our hearts to race and, tr and feel troubled. And so, God, give us some concrete to hold on to while, while we're going through those things. If we will go through those things. Give us something to hold on to, someone to hold on to. And here he came, the Son of God, the Son of Man. So core value number two, we're in this series. We just started last Sunday. Last week, again, number one, it's not about us. We honor God and his mission above all else, his glory. We talked about the importance of his glory, proclaiming his glory. This morning, core value number two, it's about bringing hope. What is our church about? Bringing hope. We go out of our way to reach people where they are. And this morning, we're taking our cue from the one who is our hope. And so John chapter 4, if you have your Bible, I invite you to follow along this morning as we read a passage that is familiar for sure. Many of you will know this passage. You've heard it. You've read it. But this woman who is thirsty, and she's not just thirsty for water. She thinks she is, but she's actually has a much deeper thirst. And Jesus is going to speak to her about that this morning and us. So verse 1, the Pharisees, John chapter 4, the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea, and he went back once more to Galilee. And verse 4, now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, so that's noontime, middle of the day. And when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? And then John notes in parentheses, his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. So he was now one-to-one, -one, alone here at the well, and here's this woman. In verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then also in parentheses, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And we're going to keep going, but we're going to stop there for now. I don't know, you hopefully heard that phrase when I just mentioned it about our core value. The second part, we, we, we're bringing hope, and the, 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 sub, the sub phrase, we go out of our way to reach people where they are. That actually, that actually means something. And I like, I like to see, I, I, it ties back to the fourth verse there where it says, now Jesus had to go through Samaria. And the truth is, a lot of Jews went around Samaria when they traveled. There was such a, a dislike, maybe even a hatred for one another, that they would purposely go around so they wouldn't have to go through this despised place called Samaria. The scene at the well in Sychar, in some ways, 
and I wasn't alive at this point, but I saw the signs. I've seen as you studied history, American history, 1950s, 1960s, civil rights. Uh, it's like the old South in some ways, 60, 70 years ago, when there was um, water fountains in towns and places all around the old South. And the water fountains, one water set of water fountains would say whites, and one, one set would say colored, and they were separated. Just think of the, the deep prejudice that drove people to design their whole plumbing system around keeping a certain group of people from drinking out of the same fountains as us. Wow. The energy involved, the calculation involved, the animosity, the prejudice, the hatred that drove that. In this story, Jesus sits down, and it's as if he is sitting next to the sign, Samaritan, colored, and he's purposefully choosing to be there. The divide between Jews and Samaritans actually dates all the way back to the divisions of the kingdom of Israel after the death of Solomon. So when Solomon died, the kingdom split. Jeroboam, Rehoboam. You go way back to 1 Kings chapter 12. And Israel becomes the northern kingdom and Judah becomes the southern kingdom. The northern territory was annexed by the Assyrians. The Assyrians came in and destroyed and took captive many of the, those who survived, took them captive, 722 B.C. We're going back in this time of Jesus over 700 years. And so the Assyrians resettled the area that they conquered, the northern air territory of Israel. They resettled it with foreigners, non-Jews, which meant a loss of both racial and religious purity from the standpoint of the Judeans in the south. Now the southern kingdom had this disdain because these weren't pure-blooded Jews any longer. There's a whole mixture and hodgepodge of people living there. The religious divide went even deeper when the Samaritans built their own temple around 400 B.C. at a place called Mount Gerizim, and it'll come up here later in the story. They built a temple. And so there's lots of backstory that Jesus is stepping right into the middle of. I'll tell you, when you go to share hope with people, you're going, typically we walk into a lot of backstory. We're not, always, we're not always aware of it. Now, Jesus was aware of it purposefully. But we're walking into situations that can sometimes have a lot of layers to them. Of course, there's also the issue of men and women. There was a rabbinic citation of that time, and the citation said, one should not talk with a woman on the street, not even with his own wife. Wow. And certainly not with somebody else's wife because of gossip. They were so concerned about gossip that they said, we're not going to talk. You don't even talk to a woman. And here's Jesus sitting by the well, talking with a Samaritan, no less, the despised Samaritan and a woman on top of that. Wow. Jesus dives right through that cultural barrier. I like what Piper says. He says, Jesus was graciously purposeful. He had a purpose, and he wanted to meet this woman. He had, there was an encounter that God, a divine appointment that God had orchestrated for him. And there was someone who needed the hope that he had to offer that day. And she was here at this well, this woman, she comes to the well, and she has an empty well within herself. You don't come to the well at noon. No one else was at the well. All the other women came either early in the morning or later in toward the evening because you don't go in the heat of the day. But no one wanted to be with her. She was lonely. 
There was some, there was, she was actually, she had a relate, she was in, in the middle of a relational desert. She had a reputation. She had been with many men. And here she is living in this desert. And Jesus, isn't it ironic? He meets her at a well for water, but she's actually living in the middle of a desert. Let's keep reading the 10th verse as we continue this morning. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you, are, where, how are you going to do this? Do you understand what it takes to get water out of this well? Are you greater, she says, verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst Indeed, the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw. I don't want to keep coming back every day. If you've got a better deal, I'd like to get in on it. I'm, I, I, I get tired of lugging my jar, my, my water jar every day. If I can get the water that, that I won't have to come, I'm in. Count me in. He told her, and here's Jesus, he told her, go call your husband and come back. Verse 17, I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Mm. I want to say something really important. As you are preparing to share hope, because God's called you to bring hope as well. It's not just me. All of us. If you're a Christ follower and you've received his hope in your life, then you're called to take that hope wherever you go, whoever you meet, how, whoever you encounter, you're, you're in life with, you're... you're you're called to bring and take that hope, right? But as you do that, one thing that I want you to know up front, number one, and this is your outline this morning, expect that there will be barriers on the way to you bringing hope. There will be barriers. Because this is a spiritual struggle that we're engaged in. We have an enemy who doesn't want us to live with hope. He wants to keep people discouraged and disillusioned and in despair and bound by fear and bound by loneliness and bound by brokenness. So he will do anything he can to keep you from bringing that hope and keep other people's chained and locked up. I was at a an event Monday night. Now, Monday was 9-11, right? So there was a, some of you may have observed, observed that day in your own way. I was actually at a, um, up in Akron area at the launching of a kind of a new, kind of a ministry uh, service for um, veterans who struggle with addiction and struggle with all kinds of, some of the stuff we do at Celebrate Recovery there's a there's a group that's committed to helping these men recover. And it was a great evening. And there's a, a friend of mine who's starting a thing called the Barracks. And his, his design is to have housing, transitional housing available for veterans who are coming out of uh, all kinds of brokenness and tough situations, PTSD and chemical substance abuse, and have beds for them and a place for them to, to sleep and recover and get healing and counseling. Awesome vision, great vision. I love Mike's heart on that. So he asked me to come and pray and, and, and be a part of that evening. And there was a guy there 
several men there, but one of the, one of the guys who spoke literally broke down into tears. Tough guy, like military guy. He's probably in his 30s now, I'm guessing maybe mid-30s, and he's been through a lot. And he, in that room of people, there's probably, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 guys and people in that room, and he, he literally broke down and talked about how he almost took his life. The number is just not that long ago, several years ago. And he, and this is a tough, this is a room full of guys that, I mean, the, the, the language in that room, you know, these are some sailors, right? These are some guys that have some, you know, they've been around the block. And between all that, this guy was being vulnerable to say, hey, I, I needed hope. And he talked about his faith. He talked about how important his faith is to him and how he has come through. Now he has, he has a mission to, that's why he, he's living in Florida, but he was up in Lancaster to help get this thing kicked off. He said, I want to go anywhere I can to help bring hope to people like you because I was there. I was there, and I, I almost didn't make it. By God's grace, I'm here. And so I'm very passionate about doing this, what God's called me to do. But there's a lot of barriers on the way. In this account, the first barrier is the cultural racial divide between Jews and Samaritans. I talked about that. But second, there is also the well or the barrier of pride. Did you, did you sniff that out? Verse 12, because this woman says to Jesus, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it as well? See, so, so Jacob was the father, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, right? And then, and then of course, so that's the line. The Samaritans still had that line. Now, it got broken when the kingdoms divided, but that was still the, the patriarch. Jacob was one of the patriarchs. Are you greater than Jacob? I can imagine Jesus just sitting there, you know, kind of like half chuckling. You know, yeah, actually, I, I pre-existed him. You know, I'm pretty much involved with all of creation, um, you know, she doesn't know who she's talking to. He's like, here's, here's, here, here he is sitting at the well. Just, it's, it's amazing the things Jesus, uh, wow. I don't, know if he's, I don't know if he laughed inside or not, but it, I, I'm laughing thinking about it. She is communicating something. She's saying our religious heritage as Samaritans, our religious heritage is enough. Like, Jacob's enough. And don't miss this. Many, many people will be hung up or stuck on a wall of some sort. When you go to people that God calls you to go to, there will be things that they get stuck on. Sometimes they get stuck on hurt, and they've been hurt and wounded, and they're, 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 they're afraid to move forward because of the hurt. I don't want to get hurt again. I don't want to get wounded again. Or they're suspicious, or they have prejudice, or they have some kind of animosity. Or often what happens is they take up someone else's fight. I don't even know what I'm fighting about, but it's there, I'm in with that. And so they don't have a but they they take up someone else's fight. The Bible reveals to us that we have three enemies: the world, the flesh, and the devil, Satan. And all three are voices that work to keep us from living with the hope that Christ offers. And so Jesus refuses to be sidetracked. I love that about him. He is laser focused. He is willing to work through the the layers that people lived under. This woman had a lot of layers, and he's very patient in this conversation going through step by step by step by step. And I, so the question I have in my notes are, are, am I, are you willing to work through the layers that people live under? You know, there's a book that came out a few years ago ago called Move Towards the Mess. And the phrasing there is, where does hope shine the brightest in the darkness? That's why we're called to move into the dark. You know, we, have, we carry the light, and God's called us to move at times, to move in toward. It's hard, but God help us because the light shines brightest in the darkness. And this woman's life is really messy. Really messy. 
It's interesting because Jesus in John chapter 3 had met with a religious somebody. Remember this conversation with Nicodemus? He's a leading religious elite, and he comes to Jesus at night to talk about these deep truths, these questions he had. John chapter 3. John chapter 4, he's meeting with a religious nobody in the middle of the day, a woman who has this reputation, who is all alone. She's living with somebody, but really her heart is just parched. She's burned through all kinds of relationships. Please understand this. At the core of bringing hope is learning how to love. Learning how to love people. Bruce Milne says it well. He says, simply put, Jesus loved her and was prepared to breach any, or excuse me, to breach age-old conventions to reach her. Our failure in sharing our faith And so our failures in sharing our faith are so often failures in love. Nothing is so guaranteed to draw others to share our living water than an awareness that we genuinely care about them. And so, God, help me to be filled with compassion. Help me to be filled with sensitivity. So when I'm with someone, you give me wisdom how to work through the layers, how to love them through the pain, how to love them through their hurts, how to love them through their suspicions and all. That is what it takes. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, teach me how to love people so that I can get close to them and bring the hope that's in me, bring it to them. You. If we are bringing hope, what is it? Verses 13 and 14, I'll remind us again in that section. He said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so the second thing is the nature of this hope this morning. It is satisfying at the deepest level of your heart. It is satisfying at the deepest level. Jesus said, all these relationships that you've been burning through, trying to get your sense of worth from, trying to get a sense of fulfillment from them, trying to get significance from them, what I have to give you will fill you at the deepest place. You will not thirst anymore in the way that you thirsted before. Your heart and your soul will be satisfied in a way that no man can fill. And the nature of the hope that Jesus gives, several things here. First of all, it's not a quick fix. It's not a Band-Aid. This woman is thinking in terms of some magic water, verse 15. Give me that magic water. I don't want to come back to this well anymore. If you've got that kind of water, I want it. Give me that. It's not magic water. And so what she was saying is what often times we say as well. I'm tired of carrying this bucket. Right? I'm tired of carrying this bucket. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I would imagine a lot of us get tired of carrying the bucket, whatever the bucket is in your life. That thing that you just feel like, I just can't. Keep doing this again and again and again and again. It's heavy. It's hard. It's a lot. And I know that we all have buckets that we carry. So part of it is, Lord, help, help, bring, bring, help me in this. I want that. But don't miss it. A renovation of the heart is not a magic bullet. God wants to renovate your heart. He wants to restore your heart. He wants to renew your heart. He wants to transform your heart. It's not about magic water or a magic bullet. There's often lots of layers that need peeled away in that work. I was reading Dan Meyer here the other day. He said, it's hard to know the truth about people sometimes. 
He said, I think of the crusty surface of Mr. Barlow, a math teacher in my high school who we all made fun of for his abrasive ways and his flights of extreme anger. We never thought about what might lie beneath the surface of the man, the darkness and pain that might be there at the bottom of his heart shaft. The truth was that Mr. Barlow had once been a wonderfully affable man, and then he got a phone call that his wife and his children had been killed in a terrible car accident. The experience began a process in which layer after layer of anger formed over his heart like a hundred feet of limestone. He said, I know a woman whose life is like a perfectly manicured lawn. Everything is trim and bordered, not a hair out of place. There is every appearance of complete perfection in her life, although the very smoothness of it seems almost compulsive. What none of her neighbors know is the childhood she had, the shunning she experienced from one one foster home to another, the desperate longing she had for a real home, and a parent who loved her unconditionally. At the bottom of her heart shaft is a terrible fear that she can't make mistakes, that she must be perfect, or once again she'll be told to move on. And now she works feverishly to keep up appearances, drowning the pain in binges with alcohol and layer and layer over the fear. He said, I've also been driven far too much by something that got broken in my heart when I was very young. As the child of a very successful family, I absorbed the message very early on that I am what I, that I am what I do. My family never intended to shape my heart this way, but my heart developed around this message nonetheless. I came to believe that my virtue and value are directly related to how competent I am in getting good grades and speaking well and being a good athlete or a leader or pleasing people with my performance. It has made me a relentless achiever and a workaholic. I live with a relentless anxiety that I need, that I need to do more. It hurts my immediate family and my workmates too often. I wish I could get back down to the bottom of my heart shaft and really drink in the truth I most thirst for. That is, it's okay sometimes to produce nothing at all, Dan. Hmm. This work, this hope that Jesus Christ offers, it's not a quick fix. It's not a Band-Aid. It is a, a hope that there's a deep level of work that he will do in our hearts to make us who he wants us to be, to, to, to transform us in the process. The second thing about this, it's satisfying at the deepest level, uh, letter B, it's not a false hope. Everything is not wrapped up in a bow. Hmm. You know, when you watch a television show, at least when we used to, when they used to have those 30 seconds you know, shows or 30 minute, 30 minute shows, everything would happen in 30 minutes. So by the time the story started and then the problem happened, and then by the end of the, all the commercial breaks, 28 minutes later, it was all, all good, all wrapped up and the, and the, and the family moved on. Happy, happy, happy. That's not this hope. The ending is going to be awesome. Eternity is going to be awesome. Heaven is going to be awesome. The promise of God is awesome. But the, in the meantime, what did Jesus say? You will have trouble. Take courage. I have overcome. You will have trouble. In this world, you will have trouble. In this world, it will be difficult. In this world, it will be hard. In this world, you will be tested. In this world, you will face fire. In this world, unexpected things will happen. But take heart. I have overcome. So the hope that he offers is not a false hope that everything's going to be tied up really nicely. We want it tied up in a bow, make it pretty, fix it, done, beautiful. That doesn't happen very often. And then thirdly here with this, it's, it's not an oversell. This hope is not an oversell. Jesus has all the resources of heaven to deliver on what he has promised. His water, his hope is superior because he is superior. The hope that Jesus offers is multidimensional. And so what do I mean by that? It, that is, it fills your well, it fills your heart, it fills your life in every dimension that you need. That's the beauty of his hope. 
in his person, in his presence, he is, what's the phrasing? He is enough. He is enough to meet every need we have at the deepest level of your heart. He is, his hope is, is able to fill a void. So if you're dealing with loneliness and acceptance and not feeling accepted, his hope can meet that spot. He can penetrate that place. If you're coming back from a failure and you need to rebuild your life and it happens, I was, as I said, I was in that room the other night with those, those military guys. They were, all of them were rebuilding their lives in one form or another. Coming back from a failure. How do we come back from a failure? How do we rebuild? The hope that Jesus Christ is able to fill that place and help us to do that work. Wisdom and under, you need wisdom and understanding for a difficult or complex situation. You're stuck on something. You're not sure how to get through something. You're not sure the next best thing. You're not sure what the decision should be. Here he comes. Here he comes. The wisdom and understanding that you need is available in what he offers. Truly. You need restoration from a broken heart or a broken relationship, and it happens all the time. Things get broken. Our hearts get broken. We need restored. Here comes his hope to fill that place. You have worry about the future. In the middle of a doubt or a fear about your future, here comes his hope to speak to that worry or that doubt. Here's the thing. The water that he gives is able to fill every crack and crevice in our lives where hope is needed. If you've got a place in your life where hope is needed, he can fill it. That's what he does. That's why it's so important that when we talk about our calling to bring hope, it's not about us or our great ideas or five tips for better living or 17 things you can do to turn your life around. It is, as Paul says in Colossians 1.27, the message that we have is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ living in you, that's where your hope's going to come from. That's what he's offering this woman. In fact, I, you know, if, you, if we continue, and we'll just finish a couple verses there, but she, she ends it. Well, they have a conversation about worship. But this woman and Jesus, they continue to talk about, she tries to divert him. And then verse 27, his disciples returned and they were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Could this be him? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. She, she was so overwhelmed by what this encounter with Jesus. She ran back to the town and said, come on, he's here. You got to meet this guy. And so she has now already received the hope, and she's running to share it with others. Come on, come, come on. You got to come out. Part of bringing the hope, don't miss this, part of bringing the hope is learning to believe it yourself. As you begin to allow the cracks and crevices of your life to be filled with him and his hope, then you can share that with others in a genuine way, a humble way, a compassionate way. Hey, look what, God, look what God has done for me. Look what Jesus Christ has done in my life. And when you, that, that's, your, that's your story. That's where it comes from. Is his hope real to you? Because this is a great truth. God's called us to bring hope. God's called us to reach people wherever they are. But it starts with, it starts with in your heart. It starts in your heart. Thank you for listening to this latest sermon. For more Prof. Church, check out our YouTube at Prof. Church Lancaster. Follow us on Facebook at Prof. Church Life, on Instagram at Prof. Church, or visit our website, profchurch.net. Thank you for listening, and be sure to make it a great day.